So I'm going to kick off because we, like Lucy said, we have got a, a, a jam-packed session this morning um, that's going to be, you know, really insightful for what stage your business is at. So um, I've already said my name's Stephanie. Um, I'm the event engagement lead at Always Possible. So this is the fourth series um, in Recover and Rise, the SME, SME Digital Accelerator. Um, so yeah, this is the fifth session. We've got two more after this. Um, and that's actually the end of the whole series, so which has been running since September. So um, anyone that's new to the series, um, these events are run by West Sussex County Council and have been taking place in September, um, organised to help small and medium businesses utilise digital tools and gain expert knowledge and advice in how best to grow your online presence and attract and retain new customers. So previous series um, prior to this have been headed up by Freedom Works and Creative Bloom and been looking at um, customers and marketing systems and productivity, and getting online. So as I said, we're into the final series run by Always Possible, looking at growth, expansion, and new products. So um, aim of the business series is to help businesses create the right conditions for growth in the digital world, something we can't get away from these days. So I'll just take this moment, just introduce you to the digital champions, who um, there's a few of them joining the session today. I think we've got Andrew, Karen, Lisa, and Nasa as well. So um, I'll pop them up on the screen in a moment, but basically anyone attending today um, will, um, following this session, have access to eight hours of free specialist support from one of our seven digital experts. So ranging specialisms in consultancy, marketing technology, and all aspects of digital adoption. Um, Lisa, who I've just popped up on the screen there, she'll be um, talking us through how you access your support later. But just for your benefit, I'm just popping them up on the screen. We've got Andrew Kerry Beddell, Lisa Kerr, Malcolm Duffett, Rachel Dines, um, Rob Lawrence, Roya Crudas, and Susan Winchester. And again, I'll share those um, slides again at the end so you can see what their specialisms are and how you can access their support. Um, everybody's got different, um, you know, requirements. So the digital champions will be, um, you know, to work with you based on what your requirement is. So experts in their field. So I've talked a little bit about the series, but um, we're on to the fifth um, session in series four. So only a couple more to go till the end. Um, today is talking about digital tools, tools for innovation. So quite a wide ranging um, subject uh, for Lucy to delve in today. And she's got a couple of people joining her today to give to get a bit of an insight. So um, there's still time to book on to the final sessions of tech driven, driven growth will be, will be joined by a panel of businesses in West Sussex talking about how digital does disrupt things, but how they've navigated that. So we've got um, various different uh, businesses, Piglet's Pantry, um, we've got Sheffield Park, we're joined by a company that supports um, businesses in off license premises. So bars and pubs who obviously hit quite um, tragically by the pandemic and how they navigated that. So hopefully you can join us for that one on Thursday. And then the final session next week on Tuesday, a week today is um, with um, all of our facilitators from the session. So Lucy will be with us um, and as well as the digital champions. So it's more of an ask the expert session. So any questions, burning things that you want to ask them, um, a bit more of an in-depth um, chat with them and ask questions. So. Um, Without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Lucy. Um, Lucy is, um, well, she works with us a lot at, um, sorry, I've gone too far. <laughs> Lucy works with us a lot as a facilitator. She's an absolute pro at this, but um, I'll let her explain a little bit about her. No, don't oversell me now, Steph. It's not going to work. And I've got my cheesy slide talking about stuff. See, Tan's already laughing about you making me up, and she's not even on the screen. Yeah, it's all good, isn't it? Well, we so, love working with her. She's got, she's got um, <laughs> Mark's some giggling, amazing giggling. anecdotes. This is not good. My interview already taking the mick out of me. It's not a good start. <laughs> Thank you, Steph. Oh, it's going to be a good session. So let me share my screen. But yeah, I'll hand it over to you, Lucy. Thank cool. you. I... Do a little bit of position about what we're going to talk about in the next hour and a half and I want to first of all very much thank my panel because I got the timing wrong for this so Tan and Mark thank you very much for having a mad panic when it was midday rather than 12 30 it's always a good start it's been that sort of week already so the session takeaways um as we were saying um while everyone was getting comfy getting their cup of tea these are the key topics that we had within the session understanding technology for innovation funding tax benefits gaining deep data insights and new products, new markets, new collaboration. This is a massive four points, isn't it? So I thought a way of approaching this, which is what we're going to do today, is to talk around it because they all interlink. I don't think these things stand uh, sort of siloed discussions. So hence me asking Mark and Tanlong, well, 
who will be introducing themselves in a moment. Um, and the, basically the uh, format is what we're doing right now, the intro, then an, an interview, um, get you warmed up, get you thinking about innovation and tools and data, and then we'll get into the workshop. Uh, it's very much an interactive session, as Steph was saying. We'd love to hear from you. We'd love you to ask questions in chat, contribute your experiences. This is the power of getting together. And what I really like about online events is you don't have to wait until the end to put your hand up. You can do it in the moment. You can, you can sort of explain how you've gone through something or how you've approached it, how you've got funding, what tools you've used. We'd like to share these experiences. So don't feel that you, you can't talk to us because I really, really enjoy having the chat on online events. And this is the slide I always hate doing, but it's quite good for you to understand where I come from and what I do. Uh, my background is, is art and English, words and pictures um, that ended up translating weirdly into sales because I also like people and I'm very curious. Um, I did a lot of work uh, in, in education, um, actually selling, um, training and I really liked having a sales engagement that had a, an impact on people and had a, an emotional engagement. I'm a solution salesperson. Um, I've done some random roles. I work for a pre-IPO startup in Silicon Valley, which is just Reading with Sunshine. Um, and I um, created and uh, ran an award-winning training company, which was sold back in 2005, which is a Cisco learning partner. So I can kind of blag tech, but I'm definitely not a techie. I evolved into partner management, getting people to collaborate I'm very passionate about partnering as being a great strategy for growth and innovation, which we are going to talk about later today. And through this kind of meandering path, um, I can't say there was a, a planned career here. I ended up at Sussex Innovation Centre, who uh, hopefully you've all heard of, who are based in Brighton, who were the, um, the third true business incubator in the UK 25 years ago, looking at the candy floss economy that we had in, in Brighton and Hove, two universities and no jobs. Uh, Sussex Innovation was created. And I worked there for five years, helping businesses from pre-start pre-idea to multi-million pound plateaus to pivoting and I managed a team of 12 graduates and placement year students there um, acting as a, a resource catalyst team still exists wonderful if you've never heard of it you should definitely tap into it um, but I grew up in, in Bath so I, I'm back now here in the west country I moved back uh, three years ago and uh, to work for a scale up business community and from there I took the slightly scary decision uh, Back, uh, I should be yeah, four years ago, I moved to three years ago, I went freelance and I kind of threw the net out to my amazing uh, colleagues all over the country and ended up doing a, a wonderful mixture of projects from UWE, which we're about to hear from in a minute, which is the University of West of England, who to always possible. I'm also work for TechSpark, which is the Bristol and Bath tech community. I head up TechSpark, Swindon and Wiltshire. I also do random things like social media for a ladder company, but I like having lots going on. I like working with, with founders and with organisations um, I'm curious, it's definitely a polite word for being nosy, but I love being a part of that journey and I, I'm really privileged to be a part of conversations like this to hopefully empower people and make connections and it's great to hear more from the, uh, the growth champions as well from the growth hub. So that's all about me. We've talked about personas in other workshops I've run. That is me as a persona. That is Caroline. Caroline is, is me with my house rabbit, Aya. Uh, she used to write blogs for a property startup. Um, we've talked about personas in some of the other workshops we've run. And it's actually a really good thing to do with innovation as we look at Business Model Canvas. It's really thinking about who you're talking to and making it very niche. So that's how I was created. I'd much rather have her up than a, a picture, to be honest with you. But that's the background. That's me. But innovation and data and funding, it's a massive topic. And I thought rather than, it's not really one for slides, it's one for conversation. So Mark and Tan, thank you so much for joining me today. Um, I shall stop sharing, get you up on the screen. Um, can I pick on you first to introduce yourselves and, and tell everybody what you do? Tan, do you wanna go first? Yeah. Hello, I'm Tan Kwan Nichols. I'm the Digital Innovation Lead at uh, the University at West of England. I manage a fund um, where we give out funding for small businesses delivering R&D. So that's what I've been doing for the past year. Um, I, I also run other things like hackathons and uh, I'm part of the Women's Tech Hub Network in Bristol as well. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mark. Hi, I'm Mark Cordroy. I'm the entrepreneur in residence at the University of West of England, and uh, I spend my days working with startups. We've probably worked with over 100 startups in the last four or five years. We help them develop in whichever way they need to develop, from raising funds, and we've raised probably over 32 million, I think, is the latest count of early stage funding for those startups. But it could also be grants. It could also be um, just organic growth. So uh, we work with a, a lot of tech companies, but it goes beyond just tech companies. 
And we've got quite a variety on these calls as well. We've got we've got sort of small organisations through to SMEs, and, and I think that's innovation is perceived as being a, a startup game. But actually, what we're going to be talking about, I think, on this is, I think I'd like to start with how companies should approach innovation, Mark. I'm going to give that one to you because innovation, I think, for a lot of established companies, feels like a lot of feels like hard work. Feels like a distraction. Yeah. Um... I suppose I see innovation as an output for organizations. You know, there are companies who, uh, you know, start off from a, they've invented something or they've, uh, they've developed something through a university or through their own sort of uh, analysis of a market. And it's only when you start to sort of take that R&D and you couple it with commercialization that you get to that innovation point. And to me, innovation is when you, when you take an idea commercially to market and that's when you start to innovate within that market and and do something different so uh, without commercialization innovation is just r d in my books and and without r d innovation is just selling something but i don't know what you'd be selling to be honest so it's i, I think the challenge for start, for early stage companies and for companies looking to develop their portfolio is um getting that balance between how you commercialize and how you yeah. do do that sort of r d type activity or that software development activity um to enable you to innovate in a in a particular market that tan's nodding i mean we we see a lot of people who are attempting to innovate and really struggling don't we in our, our conversations i also look after an innovation for growth funders when do what you can what are the key challenges because you work with a lot of early stage aren't they but they're all established businesses yeah there are so I was going to say, um, for established businesses, sometimes, um, particularly when you're looking at grant funding, you can't, people don't always know they're innovating. And sometimes it's about how they they present that information. So so quite often, people, you know, you're, you're just solving everyday problems in your business. You've all done it this year. You've all been, you know, making quick pivots on all kinds of things. And some of it is just straightforward, you know, day-to-day -day business activity and sometimes you're doing really innovative stuff and it's really some for, for the businesses we see on a day-to-day -day basis it's it is useful sometimes to have somebody else look in and identify areas where you are innovating because you might not know you're doing it so it's quite useful to have uh, to talk to someone from the outside and, and have a look at where that might qualify for, for r d tax credits or grant funding so we find that all of the time and we struggle with that with branding in Swindon and Wiltshire because we, we put innovation for growth out there and people, are, as you said, we're not innovating, we're surviving, we're evolving, we're having to do different things, we're yeah. having to re readdress the processes. So we we had to change our marketing so, and call it change and evolution. Yeah. Innovation is, is sometimes feels it feels uncomfortable as a, a, a term. Yeah, I, I tried to, yeah. Sorry, Mark. No, I, I was just going to say, I mean, that's why I quite like this idea of it's commercialising an idea because sometimes the the innovation can be a new way of commercializing something it can be taking it into a new market it can be selling it in a way that you haven't sold it previously and the, the net result is you're you're innovating in a space and and i think too many people associate innovation with what they think happens in an r d lab at a university or something like that yeah they think it's dyson they think it's an inventor mm -hmm. yeah was that it actually yeah. as i say a good organization should always be innovating to keep mm -hmm. evolving um, but I think I, th I liked it's like you've read my slides, Mark. Oh, the pieces, as you say, it doesn't exist in in, uh, in isolation because you've got to look at the resources and the markets. I mean, one of the questions about um, what makes good innovation. So, Tam, when you're reading, we, we've seen a lot of grant applications recently, haven't we? Yes, a lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, and Mark's funny because he, he, Mark also does a lot of the uh, the, the sort of uh, the proofreading. So what we do is we've both got funds that are live right now, and, and we yeah. do a lot of we do a lot of consultancy work. I so say we are that external perspective, yeah. trying to rationalise yeah, yeah, yeah. what they're doing and why they're doing. Tam, what do they get wrong? We'll start with the negative side. Okay. Um, <laughs> so uh, what people don't do is they uh, they can't separate the actual innovation activity from their day to day. And that gets that 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 is always a sort of downside for when people look at any kind of grant application. What they want to see is where the innovation project sits, and that's usually um, a new product or service. It's taking um, what you do to a new market, and and trying to and, and I know when you're in your own business, it's really difficult to separate that out. But actually, you have to be able to separate out your innovation work, your R and D work, from your day to day. And and normally most grant funders 
only pay for the, when you're going for innovation grant, only pay for the innovation part of that grant funding. So that's really, really important that you know the difference between uh, the two. And quite often that that is about the narrative. It's about telling the story. So quite often people don't mix up. The other thing they don't do is they don't, uh, they're not ambitious enough. Um, all innovation needs to be ambitious. You must never approach these things with, oh, maybe it's just a little bit useful. You know, it's got to be, we're going to change something. We're going to, you know, um, bring something new or different uh, into the market or, you know, into our practices or into the way we deliver our services. So people have got to be ambitious. And uh, and the other things do is your research. So you really need to understand how what your routes to market is. Quite often people turn up and they don't talk about their routes to market so that we don't know as a funder where what you're going to be spending, so what the purpose of your innovation is going to be, like who's going to benefit, who's going to buy it, um, how is it going to be deployed? So it's it's really important that you do your research as well. And well, that's good business practice, even if you're not looking for funding or if you're going for yeah. grants or loans. Mark, how do you help a company unpack all of this? They come to you and go, I've got this great idea, it's going to take over the world. Where do you start? Because you are that sounding board, you are that, that fresh perspective. They're too close to it. You, you might have to tell them their baby is ugly, which is always a good thing with a founder, isn't it? Or you've got to, you've got to, you've got to poke around. Where, how do yeah. you start that conversation? I think the, what we try and do is we try and get them to uh, be honest with themselves and actually say, you know, what is the problem that you're trying to address? Where is the proof that that problem exists? And how do you solve that problem? And it, 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 um, it's almost the first three slides you'll see on any good pitch deck it's uh you know the, the someone looking to make an investment or looking to work or partner almost need to get get you within those first three slides and then the rest of it just falls naturally beyond that so it's it's trying to get people to understand the market they're addressing it's amazing the number of companies we work with where they don't understand maybe the buying behavior or who does the buying or who does the influencing and if you're trying to innovate or create a service, you, you've, you've obviously got to maybe if it's you, you've got to solve a problem, which might be a business need. But you might have to address different problems that influencers and buyers have. Um, and it's just trying to put all that together. So you end up saying that, yes, you have something that's innovative and there is a market that uh, there's no point having something that's innovative if there's no sort of product market fit. And if, if you can't find someone who's prepared to uh, to, to, to pay for it. I was, I was reading at the weekend this um, a VC from America his, his philosophy is if you've got an innovation your the key challenge is to get your first 10 paying customers because if you can get 10 paying customers you can then get 100 paying customers and then you can get a thousand paying customers it's actually the it's those first 10 paying customers you know there are a quarter of a million companies in the, in the UK that employ more than 10 people you know if you can find those first 10 there's a big enough pool to go on and scale and but the innovation market fit is really determined right at the start of the journey and if you've got an existing client base and it's an evolution of your business you've got to see those guys yeah. as your low-hanging fruit haven't you yeah yeah um and i came across another company at the weekend where you know you, you mentioned the need to, to, to innovate all the time this is a company that has got that their, their annual turnover in in recurring revenue is four billion dollars and they're still growing at 23%. And they've gone from having one product two or three years ago to their core product now only accounting for 60% of that 4 billion turnover. Now, you know, if companies at that end of the bit market are you know, looking for new ways of servicing their customers and improving how their customers work, it's, you know, it, there's never a time where you can sit back and say, I don't need to do this anymore. But a lot of founders will say they haven't got time. A lot of people probably in this call are running their own business will go, that all sounds lovely, but when do I make time to do it? Um, I think it's uh, to me it's the, it is the key part of being a founder to be honest it's it is you know the founder is the, that key salesperson who's got to find those first 10 clients and the, you know the founder wears many hats in a startup and it's the it's you know one of the biggest challenges they have but um, uh, a team helps but you know ultimately you're you're all trying to take an idea to market and that's that's the hardest part of the journey it's the, it's the that first fifty thousand pound grant, or that first hundred thousand pound angel investment, or those first ten customers, it it, it, it never always it doesn't always seem it, but it never it does actually get easier after you get after you get over those initial hurdles. 
Uh, but I also think that it's quite important to look at the resources around you so it doesn't you don't feel it all sits on you. I mean, um, well, I'm speaking to a university here, but obviously we, I'm going to reference all the universities that are in West Sussex as well. You know, you, you've got resources around you. It's not all on you. You've got the the growth champions. You've got your growth. Hub, you've got you've got to look at your infrastructure, which sometimes again, if you're running a business, you don't look up above. And, and realize what's around you. Tan, you mentioned about doing your research and really understanding that the, you know, the digital tools and the, the funding routes. Where do you start? Because there's, again, there's a lot of information out there. Yes. <laughs> Where do you start? Um, um, actually, just, just going back on the previous point, I was going to say, I think it's interesting you asked that question about time because it, it really does take time. And one of the things that I do say to people is that if people aren't going to put the time in, then they shouldn't be um applying for grants or doing that sort of thing because it does and, and there is you can buy in expertise in terms of some of it and um and you're right there's loads of people out there who can help you so going on to your point about where information comes from um there are a million places to look i mean um we uh, at, at UE we use Bohurst which is a, a system here where we can look at you know the the sort of the markets and what what people are doing out there um there are you can access your local growth hub they should be sign point signposting you to um support I'm, I'm not quite sure where the mechanisms are in in the region but it's on kind the of, call coast capital on the call so we have some yeah. of the growth champions here which is great the other thing i was going to say is actually some of the uh, intermediary organizations like uh lawyers accountants um uh sort of r d tax credit providers also provide some information in the background as well so there are professionals who want your business and therefore will um will give you some free advice so you'll you'll see quite a lot of online courses and things like that provided by these um organizations these sort of um it's part of their business development but there's quite a lot of free information out there that, that you can access um yeah there's absolutely loads of places and of course ask your customer. So if you are innovating around a product and you are looking to put something new on the market and you have a pre-existing list of customers, you should be testing out your idea on your existing customers and seeing where the market is because they're perfect for doing that sort of thing, really. They, they, will, give you, they will give you their opinion and it's, it's the right place to start asking. Yeah, absolutely. As someone's mentioned in chat, Corey, right, it bonus, it bonus is an expensive tool, but universities have access to it. So we've just mentioned Sussex Innovation yeah. Centre. Um, we're also going to talk about the BIPC when I, I'm doing my the workshop in the BIPC, which is the British Library. That's all free. And you can get onto Mintel and a whole fame and a whole range of, yeah. of databases with them. Again, there, there are routes to access this information for free, but it's going out with the right questions. So you've got to do some work before you go out. Otherwise, you just end up drowning in data as well, don't you? But yeah. you've got you've got to get that. You, you can get so much market intelligence. Um, and it, it is all about making sure that you, you've kind of filtered the ask, I think, is a key thing. So you don't end up not doing anything because you're overwhelmed. We've had I've, a... Go on, go on, Mark. I was just going to say, I think you know, working with sort of early stage entrepreneurs, you know, the good ones develop very sharp elbows and they're very very good at getting to the front of the queue and they're very very good at um finding i mean i, I see, see rebecca was talking about the the bow the cost of bohurst i mean i i spend a lot of time you know with providing lists of vcs and you know showing other companies and it's it's where universities i think add value to these startups um we have a, a whole host of sort of innovation support services from robotic labs and health tech hab labs and you know the, the startups use those sorts of facilities extensively because you know it helps them sort of punch above their weight they can use equipment they can't afford they can use services they they wouldn't have in-house so it's it's sort of about digging around your local ecosystem yeah, yeah absolutely yeah. There's, there's always networks as well you can always throw a, a question out to your networks yep. and see what they have to say I, I think sometimes when we meet people with really good ideas some people get really frightened of um saying their idea out loud um one either giving that idea away and and you know someone nicking their idea and the other is that uh, people don't want to put their baby out there for people to criticize so it's kind of it's it's a I, I, I mean I think I think on both of those actually if, if you've got an idea that is um, stealable 
um, you do have to be careful, but actually most people are already, people, somebody is already trying to solve those problems if, if they're already out there. So um, I, I think it is worth testing your idea out in the out in your networks and making sure that you've thought through everything. And you're, yeah, they're the ones that will be able to, to find the gaps or the holes in what you're thinking about and things like that. So don't be afraid to ask. And try and try and, and pivot. And, and, and I think we talk about sorts, but I mean, all of those resources are, are free, available to SMEs. As you know, that it doesn't matter what scale you are, you just got to go and I think sometimes with universities, especially, it's difficult to find the front door. We we are in effect the front door at UE, Sync is the front door to Sussex, you've got Chichester, you've got Brighton, they've all got business teams, they've all got equivalents of a future space of some shape or form or Sussex Innovation, and they want to engage with businesses, they've got a remit to do that. Um, but going back to how we fund all these things, all the pieces you've just given me, I mean, I'm going to be talking about business model canvas going forward. It's uh, you need to kind of map it out in some some sort of form to get it out of your head. Tan's nodding. Come on, Tan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, get a plan together. I mean, do you know we watch we watch SMEs evolve with us, and they you know they sometimes come and um, they they've got an idea and they start mapping it out. And once they've tested it and they've asked the questions, they change that idea, and people go from one thing to another quite quickly actually and and that that process is 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 really normal you know it's okay not to stick doggedly to one idea if you if you test a market and it isn't the way you think it's going to be then it's then it's good to sort of adapt and change and grow and sometimes people start off with one kind of business and they end up with a different one and and, and that's all good you know so we you know um yeah, sorry I was going to mention a company but I can't sorry <laughs> <laughs> so yeah so we have got companies that come in and they 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 start with one thing and, and actually the very process of um writing an application is a really good way of sorting your head out as well so i've had ones that come in write an application they didn't get the funding because the idea wasn't developed enough and they come back a year later and their entire business model has changed and they've you know they've they've they filled in all the gaps and that's now become something different and that's been you know it's a really amazing journey to watch them go on actually well, so it's, we it's putting it out though isn't it as you were just saying they're holding on yeah. to the they put it out to us we, it's our role to be honest yeah you know our agenda is to support their growth we, we, we don't have any other sort of perspective other than that but you do need you do need to give that reflection mark exactly what you said at the beginning is you, you need to be brave and go show somebody and i think the frustrating thing that i i feel that when we all do sort of those those board sessions it's when they don't listen yeah yeah i, I very much try and get people i mean I just go back on the ideas being stolen I think we've worked with about 100 companies and I can't think of a case where an idea has been stolen. We've had people who come in and been very paranoid about it and it just doesn't happen. Most people are just too busy with, with what they're doing. Um, and you're right, the, 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 the idea of listening, I mean, I, I say to people, you know, you don't have to take any advice. You're not, I'm not benefiting from you. You're not paying me. You, it, it's, you know, it's just an opinion. But, um, but if you can get companies to start thinking in touch slices of time and what they want to achieve in those slices of time. So if you're raising uh, a small angel round or you're getting a, a bid from Innovate or, you know, wh how are you going to be different as a business when you've actually consumed that money? You know, why are you in a better state to actually either raise more money or be more successful in the market? Um, and I think the danger, you know, the companies that don't succeed are the ones that sort of um, drift and they just sort of exist and hope things are going to happen rather than drive an agenda. Um, so it's all about, you know, you're, you're, you're raising X thousand, that's going to last you 12 months. Why are you going to be in a different place in 12 months because of what you've just done? You've got to have that vision, I think, and that's really important. I've also known people who've got funding and have just burnt through it because they haven't really defined what they're going to use it for. I've seen hundreds of thousands being burnt and not actually create any momentum, which is slightly terrifying. Um, there's a question from Karen around using um, innovate with new markets with digital tools. I mean, for me, the digital tools I was thinking about were some of the databases we were talking about. I don't know whether you'd use tools to, to create sort of that, that structure. What are your thoughts on that one? wouldn't start with the tools <laughs> I, I would start with what you're trying to achieve and then I don't I mean there is a lot of tools out there and you know quite often people think they 
So, so the sort of things we quite often get is people say, I'm going to create a, an all-in system where I'm going to have video training, I'm going to have, uh, I'm going to have um, messaging, we're going to have a community and all this sort of stuff. And you're saying, well, actually, aren't those tools already out there? Are, you know, are you, are there people all, you know, so there are a lot of digital tools. Don't, don't try and invent it. Building your own video conferencing uh, system is, is actually quite an expensive thing to do. But to try and link existing tools together is the way a lot of very clever people are doing it. And let's face it, you know, Airbnb, Uber, all exist, linked together existing tools. They didn't actually invent the technologies that happen. So, so, you know, quite a lot of very, very successful innovations happen when people are taking a, a unique idea and then linking in pre-existing technologies to make it all work. So that's, that's kind of, so, so I guess I wouldn't start with the tools. I would start with what the problem you're trying to solve. And then I try to identify what digital tools are out there that might already exist that you can either integrate or build into what you're doing. And then there might be a bit of linking or a bit of, you know, something to make it work better. So it's, it, it's, it's that side. That's how I would approach it. I wouldn't, I wouldn't do it the other way around. Um, I wouldn't start with a tool. Yeah, no, I, I would agree. I think the, the danger with a lot of technology startups is they get focused you know obsessed with the technology sometimes and sometimes it's about what do you have to demonstrate to show someone that you've got credibility that you've solved a problem and sometimes you can do that with just literally sticking bits to, you know mocking things up but building very simple prototypes um, it's enough to get a market to say that they they may not buy it at that stage but you can find out whether they would buy it or something like that and uh, I think you're right and the, the tools come later you know when you actually know the solution you're solving then you can actually identify what's the best tool out there to, to help you solve it yeah absolutely and so we're putting all these pieces together and we're what when you what makes your heart sing was what what makes good innovation when somebody comes to, to see you is it having all these pieces together having the vision is it everything pulled together <laughs> <laughs> what what make my what makes my heart sink is when I see people who um, have the passion, but there is something in their mind that's blocking something. You know, they they they've obsessed about a particular segment or a particular space or a particular way to market. Um, to me, that the most uh, successful entrepreneurs are the people who are open to ideas as well. You know, you've you've got to be you you've got to have that sort of you've got to be driven. Um, but you, it's, it's when you see opportunity going to waste. That, that, that to me is the, uh, the most disheartening part of the job. I mean, you, know, you, you, you know that if you work with early stage companies, a high proportion of them aren't gonna make it, um, but there are ways of failing and you know, there are ways of failing that you've given it your best shot and there's ways of failing because you've been stubborn and weren't prepared to change or something like that and I, I think that's it's the wasted opportunity that's the, the bit that really is uh the the thing that gets my back to be honest yeah some really good ideas don't don't happen and and uh i was going to say sometimes um it's useful for people to, to share that journey as well so um quite often lone inventors can be quite um you know, have a, a single invention that they'd like to take to market and it's normally very good and, and, and everything else. But sometimes it's useful to bring in another person to try and share that journey, to try and get a different perspective on things. Um, what makes me happy though, is, um, is where, where people come in and they are both ambitious and realistic. So they, they have a big picture, they know what the direction of travel, they know where they're going, but actually they've identified a step and they know they're going to get funding for that step or they're going to deliver very specific targets and uh, and they're very clear to speak to they say well i'm going to do this and then once i've done that i'm going to do this next part and that's really amazing because they've plotted their journey and they've thought through they've got the big ambition always in their sights but actually they're taking single steps towards them and that that's always brilliant when you see that because people are you know that people have got a plan it's not always go to plan but they've got a plan <laughs> <laughs> No, absolutely. I, I think you're right. I, I've seen so many. The problem is, I, you've touched on a good point, there's having more than one person leading the project. So you do have um, a joint founder or you have somebody working with you on it. I think scattergunning and lack of focus and people, that's kind of the shiny thing, isn't it? It's just not really focusing on it and not putting the right structure and tools in place. They're unfundable as well, because as a funder, you'd be terrified. Yeah, I, I, I go as far as to say to people, you know, 
I can't really think of a successful company we've worked with that's raised funds as a, a, a single founder business. And, you know, part of the process we, we, we talk to people about is finding that, that co-founder to do the journey with you, because um, uh, particularly when you're going out to sort of angels and VCs at a later stage, they just don't want to fund single, single uh, founder businesses. So if we had an SME listening to this, who's thinking, oh, I want to, I can't, gosh, I have kind of been innovating over the last couple of years. I didn't call, I didn't call it that. I called it coping with COVID and getting through. What, what would you say they should do to, to keep that as part of their strategy going forward? Because I think a lot of people might think, okay, that was a survival mechanism rather than a, a long-term way of running the business. I think this idea of always having a, having either whether it's external or internal having people that you can uh sort of step sometimes outside the business and then talk and i think one one of the things the last two years forced everyone to do was to step outside their normal day job in some form or other um and so that that process was forced on everyone um and i think this idea of continually reviewing what you're doing and not getting sort of uh in that proverbial rut um and being aware of you know what technologies or what techniques are being deployed in the market around you um you know you you run a cheese shop when when do you go online do you go online do you start selling online you know it's all those sort of things that come in from the side that can change how you do your work and uh, just be open to ideas and i think I, I think innovation is as much about mindset um, you have, you know, whether it's whether you're a glass half full or a glass half empty person, um, I think good innovators are always looking to try and improve the status quo. One of, one of the things we're seeing a lot at the moment is, uh, it's really interesting to watch cheese shops, Mark, is that one of the things that we're seeing a lot of at, at, at the moment is that industries that are not traditionally um, technical or digital are picking up a lot of this digital transformation work that's happening at the moment and they're doing some serious innovation around food food production um architecture you know all the sort of industries where we're we, i'm starting to see really interesting stuff that's happening so it's not innovation is not just for you know just the tech companies but actually this innovation is now if you're running any kind of business this last few years should be making you think differently about how you approach your customers how you manage your data how you uh, run your processes how you recruit how you train your staff um and all of that uh, even where they're located and where you sit them is now moving into digital space and and, and innovation has got a big part to do it's going to be a really big part of that and so we're seeing we're seeing all, all of that happening at the moment and, and some of the best and most successful innovations are a long-standing cheese shops you know starting to, to sort of sell online moving the production online moving it to um sort of digital manufacturing processes and all sorts of things so it's really interesting um so yeah that's that's kind of where that's what we see it, it has been a forced evolution and it's not always been comfortable as you know i've been working with uh, tech for good uh, training better online tech for good which is in the Bristol and bath region and as you say we had a whole pile of companies going okay the doors are locked what do i do how do i survive how, what tools could I use? What's best practice? And they, they came to us as tech spark because they're quite scared of going to a digital agency because they didn't know what they didn't know. They had to kind of work through the tools and the processes. And the, I mean, one poor guy had actually had his website locked up. But you know, for, for, the, for the SMEs who are in a non-digital space, it's been a bit of a, quite a terrifying moment. But if they've got through, they probably have a much more robust broader business. I mean, you mentioned tea. I, th I think about Piglet's Pantry, who uh, sort of worthing way. You know, they used to provide pies into the football stadiums. I think at the Amex Stadium in Brighton, the game was that Saturday when we went to lockdown on Wednesday, they suddenly got a few thousand pies. They went online. They, they pivoted. Now they've got the most amazing, if you Google it, Tan, you'll, make, you'll be hungry. They've got the most amazing online business now, but it was accidental. But now actually that's the future of their business. So I think it's that resilience, isn't it, of going, okay, I've, I've been sideswiped, but I'll get up and I'll keep going. And that's, that's really hard to do. I think that, that that's probably been the biggest single change over the last 10 or 15 years. You know, you don't have to be a technologist to benefit from technology innovation now. An awful lot of the, you know, the tools are out there to help anyone innovate if they, if they need to. Yeah, and it's and as you say, I think the key thing is, is, is go out and ask best practice, go to peer groups, go to networking, see what other people in your space have done, tap into the growth hub, tap into the universities and use all these resources. 
Thank you both. That was a nice, but I, the key thing I've struggled with when we've been doing our funding is people just not being able to explain what they're doing and how they're doing it. And so therefore they can't be getting funding. They don't know where to go. If you can't articulate it, it's back to that pitching. You know, we, we do pitch me and pitch clubs and that's not necessarily to do uh, one for an actual funding bid, but to just be able to do that elevator. What do you do and how do you do it? So many businesses really struggle with that. Yeah, and I, I think that's the, I don't think there is a one size that fits all. And that's, I think we try and do a lot of one-to-one -one with companies because um, there are so many different reasons why some people will have problems addressing the market. Some people have problems addressing um, a technology innovation. Um, but they are in the same market space, but they come at it, you know, they have different problems. And so it's really that one-to-one -one is the, I think the key to unblocking some of that. Yeah, make time. I think a lot, a lot of founders or business owners don't think they have time to go out and spend, this whole thing we say is working, working on the business rather than in the business. Mm -hmm. There's some wonderful resources in a couple of days, Tan and I, Tan's and I, we, we've all been running workshops, haven't we? In real life, actually, we did at the end of last year, that was lovely. But getting people out and just sitting them with other people who run their own businesses yeah. is, is gold dust. How did you approach that? What did you do? Yeah. No, yeah, it's not people, just you. It's quite get a lot. Yeah, people get a lot from sharing that experience with each other. And, um, you know, it's very, it, it, there, there are numerous things that people can do. And it's just finding out what other people are doing and, um, and how they've solved problems that helps give you ideas and, and, and come up with new solutions. Because there's a vast, you know, we said we're not talking about, you know, the tool, the tool specifically, but you know, if you, you you Google CRM, you know, you come up with with half a million of them, wouldn't you? And most organisations that we work with don't even know, you know, what that means, let alone how they'd implement it. So yeah, go out and, and work with some peers. But innovating maybe needs a bit of a rebrand as a name. Yeah. Maybe it is evolution, it's growth, and it's energy. Yeah. Thank you both very much for your time. I'll let you, I'll let you get back to lunch and your smoothie tan. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Cool. Thanks very much. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Cool. So the purpose of that, I mean, obviously, as we said on the the uh, the topics, what we're looking at today is we're trying to understand technology for innovation. But actually, it's not looking at CRMs and ERPs. It's looking at, at uh, the tools for that as well. So that's what I was mentioning with the the uh, things like Bohurst and the other databases you can you can access as well. But thank you very much to Tan and to Mark there. And coming back to what innovation is, as they rightly said, it's not about reinventing, it's not about being, you know, uh, James Dyson. It, it is a new idea or a method. Um, and we're looking at sort of innovation from a funding perspective and from a data perspective. And when we're thinking about funders, and that by funder that could be a bank loan, it could be, um, could be a grant, as we were talking about, but we've got ERDF money that's coming in at the moment still, the final sort of tranche of that. But also, even just as a business perspective, is, is really looking and mapping out your project. And I think that's what Mark was saying is, you know, we, innovation feels like, um, it's like calling everyone an entrepreneur, isn't it? I know a lot of business owners feel really uncomfortable with that as a, as a brand, as a, as a tag. This is actually a question from an Innovation for Growth Fund in Swindon and Wiltshire. And this is what we're looking at. It's not about reinventing the wheel. It, it's looking at just doing things differently. It's looking at, you know, we don't expect everybody to be the next Uber. I think that's probably one of the most overused uh, sort of conversations that every startup seems to have. But as an SME, what we're talking about with innovation is looking at existing process techniques and are all disruptive. So you could be bringing in new technologies, but you might just be addressing a new market or working on a different platform. So the key thing is innovation is anything that isn't business as usual. And it does normally involve some sorts of research and development because you're going to have some unknowns. It could be a natural evolution for your business, but you still want to be rationalizing it and reflecting and looking back. And the application of existing process of techniques in new areas. So you might be one example I'm working with right now that they are implementing an ERP system and that for them is a, a massive revolution to a family business who's done his transaction in a very traditional way for the last 20 years, the son has taken on the business. And for them, that, that's pretty different. Other people might be bringing in new process and techniques but they might be a blend. It's quite rare that someone's inventing something totally different, but they could be. That disruptive approach is actually probably where most funders get most uh, concerned, unless you have a track record in that space as well. But I think as businesses, I'm sure most of you, as Town was saying, have innovated hugely because we were, we were forced to really, weren't we, during, during lockdown. I don't know if anybody, any of the businesses here wants to talk about how they might have evolved, but 
I also feel that, that, that sometimes forced innovation, getting out of the comfort zone can, can be a huge benefit. We talked about a lot of people on the high street, uh, retail, hospitality especially, who, if they could, had to find different markets and then had to suddenly leverage the data they'd collected that they'd never really had time to utilize. Um, so, I mean, we're not going to have polls up on this one, but if anybody who's listening from as a, as a small business, as an SME, uh, wants to share an example of innovation, you don't have to, you can just, you can DM me if you like, you don't have to share it with uh, the audience, but I think maybe reflecting going, okay, that felt like survival, but actually it was innovation and looking at also at how you funded that when that was a, a conversation you were, you know, having maybe just at the time. Um, R&D, again, I don't think these are, again, R&D, a lot of uh, SMEs, you think R&D is more for people who are in the tech or in the science space, but in any new project, you sit there and start scoping out what your innovation could look like or what you'd like to do or an idea you've had, you've got to really understand what, what that's going to mean and, and make sure that, as Mark was saying, the goal is that everything links into the bottom line. You know, it's not all about reinvent, reinventing something just for the fun of it. Well, that sounds incredibly glamorous. You've got a business to run, you've got to rationalize and do some research as to whether this is a good idea and whether that is actually going to be of benefit to your company's growth longer term. And again, this is from a funding perspective. This is the innovation questions, the R&D. We, we want to see, and the reason I took this out, this is from the Swindon Wiltshire Fund again. When you're looking at innovation, when you are getting out and reflecting on it, I like these questions here about the, where uh, the unknowns and the uncertainties and the challenges. And be really honest that if you are going through a, a revolution in your business, it's going to feel a bit uncomfortable at times, isn't it? It's going to have that moment where you're thinking, this is a little bit scary. Innovation should always feel like a stretch, um, but it's a calculated stretch. So again, all these questions that you might see on, a, on any grant application or even your bank's going to want to see this if you're getting a loan uh, or crowdfunding or however you're approaching funding your innovation you're going to be answering these questions and and any kind of funder wants to see that you've gone through so in this example this is the fund i'm working on we like people to tell us i know what i'm doing this is my this is my business this is my area of expertise but it's a little bit daunting i'm backing myself but yeah it's a it is still a bit of a leap out of our comfort zone but i'm really aware that it's going to we are going to be able to create jobs, we're going to create revenues, we're going to create growth, but I still have a concern there's going to be a challenge, but there is true innovation in this. This is the sort of thing that you want to ask yourself. So as Tam was saying, filling in an application form for a grant, um, which can be a bit of a beast at times, is really good to rationalise all the pieces of your innovation project and of your, your plan going forward. And you haven't got to be reinventing the world zero to one. It's a great book. Um, one of the founders of PayPal, you know, he, he feels that if you're, you're not, uh, you know, zero to one point, one point one, one point two, that's not enough. He, he wants to go to one, something completely different. Actually, for most of us, that's not going to be achievable. I'd rather do something like Propellernet, who are an agency based in Brighton, who just made some calls on how they do their business, who they work with, how their, their brands and their vision. And they've evolved through innovating by doing businesses the way they want to do business. So what does innovation mean to you as a business? Actually, it's a really personal thing. Um, and I think it's also quite interesting to look at who you see as a founder or a business owner as being innovative and why, looking out in your sector and others. And um, when we mentioned Piglet's Pantry, it's a great example of a very traditional business as it was, being forced to go online and totally innovating. And the founder's daughter got very involved with the branding and they've got wonderful uh, ambassadors and influence on social media. They have... I think if you, you told the founder two years ago, the business they have now, she wouldn't have believed you for a start, but she probably would have thought, how, how on earth do I get there? Um, but who do you see as innovative? I don't know if I see that as being the, the, the Dysons and the um, and Elon Musk and those sorts of guys. It, is it those companies who just, who've been going for 40 years and just keep on learning, evolving, moving, growing? You know, it, do, do we have more respect for kind of the, uh, the spark or for the long term again do feel free to put that in chat if you want to share your your experiences but I also think a lot of people feel they should only look in their sector and the peers and then I'm a lot of people I, I speak to you oh, I'm going to get a mentor but it's got to be somebody who's done exactly what I've done actually I'm a great believer in pillaging what's happened in other um, sectors and and seeing what you can learn from them and, and applying it to your own a lot of uh, disruption comes from that, just sort of taking taking something and moving it in. I think it's very rare that Tan used the word unique. I, I ban that from any, uh, any pitching or any uh, bids that I work on because very, very rarely is anything unique. 
I wouldn't looking at the starting to innovate so when you're you're thinking you know okay i'm gonna i'm gonna address this word innovation i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna bring it on but i want to have an innovation mindset in my business and that's with your team you need to change the mindset i think you can get a lot of people who are going well okay i'm i'm, I'm moving i'm breaking even it's not broken and to move out and innovate, you have to change your mindset. You, you're going to have to look at how you work. You're going to have to do it differently. Um, maybe you know, make, reach out to, to the growth hub, to the universities, to the chambers, and actually engage with your community. So you've got to change your mindset. You've got to, you've got to be curious. A successful business owner is always curious, whether you're reading, we talk about sort of great, great uh, magazines to read from an innovation perspective, but also get perspective. A lot of business owners are so busy with their head down that they don't look up and then they don't really see how competitors, peers, um, supporters, partners potentially all doing. And you need to have that because it all gives you all the pieces. You don't know everything as a business owner and it is a lonely environment if you're trying to do it by yourself, even if you've got a team as the leader, to get out there and other meet, meet other leaders and share, obviously, time Time, people and money tend to be the three things that everyone gets the most stressed about, you know, but go out and look at how other people have dealt with it, what tools they've brought on board, how they've approached it, where they've got funding, put all the pieces together and really make this fun. You know, if we've, we've got through, if we could survive the last two years, let, what are we going to do in 2022? Really have fun, put a rocket up this, this business that we're running and, and move it forward with all those lessons we've learned. If we can survive this, we, we you know, we can take on the world if we want to, um, but rationalise the ideas as well. So if you sit there and say, right, I'm going to go and meet up with somebody or get the team together, we're going to do um, a bit of a, a brainstorming session about all things we could do. And we're going to ask some uh, our customers about what they'd love us to do and then really rationalise them all down. So, again, with all this, we don't want to stretch you too thinly as a founder because we know that everybody is time poor. And then getting planning. We're going to look at some tools in a minute to start you with that planning and how we innovate and then implement and repeat. And it becomes but I break it down into small chunks so that you don't lose heart. Because innovating at the truest scale is, is quite hard. And so we're going to use a tool I'd recommend to everybody. If you're looking at innovating or getting grant funding or looking at all the other pieces, as I say, the tools, the key resources on there as well. Um, hopefully everybody on here has seen Business Model Canvas. Um, I'm, I'm a big fan because it's very simple. It's great for innovation because you can have all of the, the pieces that you need to consider on one sheet. Um, as you can see in front of you here. So when you're looking to fill in an application form or rationalize your, your go to market or think about what tools you need to deliver this innovation, you've got your customer segments, your value proposition, your routes to market, your resources, revenue streams, partners, all things you need to think about. So if you sit there and say, our existing customer base is telling us that this is a really good idea, what does that look like logistically? What does it look like from a sales, marketing, resources, activities, cost and revenue stream perspective? I would get this up on a whiteboard and, and maybe get someone who doesn't work for you. So if you have a mentor, um, uh, a consultant, you know, somebody you trust to come and really brainstorm with you and ask why and give you a bit of a poke and get you out of your comfort zone. But if you can map this out, you've got a pretty robust application if you're looking at getting funding for it but also a very clear picture on how you're going to get out there and sell it to whom with what message. So this can really rationalise it. So if you're working around the, around the business model canvas and can't answer all these questions, you might need to do a little bit more work on your innovation. So it's a great tool. It's open source, totally free to use. So if it's something you haven't seen before, strategizer.com, as you can see on the bottom of the, uh, the box there, you can have, there are videos which talk you through each individual segment, how they all connect together and how you approach it. So it's a wonderful tool all online, um, lots of uh, YouTube, lots of examples. Here's Airbnb as an example of a completed total business um, canvas. Obviously, you can do this for each individual idea that you have if you'd like to. And, and I was quite surprised actually with Airbnb about how, how many segments they had and how many value propositions. It's quite a complicated looking one, but actually, it, it makes sense as I've used this because we've all used Airbnb, I'm, I'm assuming it, it makes sense to me to sort of break down all the different pieces that you have for there. It's yeah, at least it's a great mind mapping tool. And I, I really, um, I really enjoy um, Miro as well. So the whiteboarding, there's lots of really good tools. Yep, there you go. <laughs> lots of really good tools to, to get your ideas together, because this is one of the key things. If, you, if it's bubbling around your head, get it out there and use it. Um, and but do get someone to do it with you. Uh, I had somebody say to me, I was quite bored doing business model canvas by myself. It's no, it's a conversation and doing a canvas should take a full day if you're working it through with somebody.
yeah, I, mean, I like Miro as well, but there are, there are lots of tools out and I think it's working out what you want them to do for you as well, isn't it? Um, and the deep data insights, the, the, the uh, BIPC, I know some comments in chat around the limitations on the, the Brighton one. Um, I wasn't aware of that. I mean, I uh, always possible we helped uh, the launch of the IP centre. I mean, if you have to tap into Bristol, I found one of the challenges with the amount of data they have is knowing the right question to ask them because they've got access to all those databases. That's just a small number of them. So you need quite a specific ask. But if you've narrowed your idea down using business model canvas, using your existing clients and your data you have, so you can go and find out how many people are doing X, I think the BIPC is a good place to start um, and to tap into their resources as well. So also we've well, we mentioned this slide, didn't we as well, the um, deep data insights, Bohurst, good feedback. It, it is expensive, but you can tap into it through universities. Um, I would say Sussex Innovation Centre should be able to help if they can't. Um, you've also got so Chichester and, and Brighton universities have got different business schools. That's a good way to tap in. Obviously, the Growth Hub. I mean, I'm amazed by how many businesses don't realise that Growth Hub exists, obviously, around the country. And tapping into their resources, signing up for their newsletters, understanding there's been, there has been a wealth of support over the last two years. The, the teams have all grown in every Growth Hub. Um, how that will evolve going forward. I know we have had some different funds coming through, but that's always good to sign up for the newsletters to see what, what funds are coming through, what um, events, workshops, and access to resources. They're a great signposter. So again, if you have a question, it's definitely a place to go. We've, we've given a thumbs up to the universities there, the Chister, Brighton and Sussex. Um, and we're quite lucky in Sussex, we can also tap into London. I, I'm working in Swindon and Wiltshire on my, my, uh, my UE project. We don't have any universities. So we are busy, Oxford, Brooks, Reading, Bournemouth, Set Squared. It is one of the great things of lockdown is that universities, it's, they've become easier to engage with. We also have the Sussex Chamber of Commerce. Um, again, a great route to, to resources and connections. I actually forgot to put the FSB up on here. I do apologize to the Federation of Small Businesses. But these are all really good people who have that signposting role, that, that hub role to be able to, to link you out from there. Um, and I think I put, I put LinkedIn in there because I think a lot of SMEs um, don't use LinkedIn as the tool it can be, not only from a, a connections perspective, but getting your, your brand awareness out there, but also we're going to talk about partnering and about connections. Um, and to, we, you know, to be honest, getting sales, it's, it's a great sort of wealth for that. But you can also then look at your competitors, look at your peers and understand what's going on in your market space and, and what the conversations are. And I put a Facebook there. That's not, it depends on what sort of business you are. I think, you know, I find uh, Facebook more from a retail perspective than, than LinkedIn would be. But you've got lots of great data insights around you that you need to tap into. And we talked about competitors and aspirational competitors. And um, when you're looking at your innovation and your strategy, I think, uh, as Mark was alluding to, a lot of people tend to do it as a silo and, and don't have that perspective. So it's quite good, especially when you're looking at innovating, to see what everybody else in the market is doing and see what you could do and how you could do it differently and what you might uh, borrow from your competitors. It's always quite an interesting space to do that as well. I think I always found when I, I ran a uh, my Cisco, Cisco learning partner, I would take the time, probably every quarter at least, to look at the competitors and see what they were doing and how they were doing it. And there would be as much to make sure I could differentiate and use different language as it would be to look at how I could complement and maybe uh, do similar things. And your innovation will have competitors. So if you're thinking about doing something differently, pivoting your business, evolving, it's always good to look out to see who else in the space is doing something that feels familiar because it's all not always obvious. Some of them customers might perceive as competitors. So I would, when you're mapping out your innovation and looking at your competitors, don't stalk them, but sign up to newsletters, follow them on social, go and see how easy they are to engage, map out the USPs. Again, this perspective of where your business and where your your innovation will sit in, in perspective with everybody else. So when you're doing your marketing, when you're building that business model canvas, you are very clear where you sit in comparison. Um, and I, fresh perspectives, back to that sort of in different ways of, of gaining it. Uh, I love Career Magazine, one of my uh, go-tos every month that comes through the door. And I this, this uh, How to Start a Business came out a year ago. And although its title suggests that it is just for startups, it, it really isn't. It's got some great models and some great tools in there to help you with that mapping and refreshing that you would do as an existing business, you should be doing it um, to, to review sort of 
your landscape and your, persp your perspective. But if you are breaking out an innovation, the tools will also be very good for that, breaking out something new, a fresh product or service or perspective. So that is a wonderful uh, magazine and also available uh, online as well. All the tools are here as well. And I put some of these in as a bit of fun. How to be more pirate is about culture and thinking differently. That's the application of it. Purple Cow is wonderful from a marketing perspective. Um, very small business book. My favorite, Two Minutes and Do Waffle. Lean Startup, um, again, a great way of running an innovation, applicable for any type of business, just to, to, to break it down, do minimum viable products, keep it moving forward. And the Momtas test is also great fun. That's all about asking the right people what they think of your your new product, your new service. The mom test relates to going and asking the wrong people the wrong question. So the, the premise being, if you went and ask your mum if she likes what you've done, she'll probably say yes, because she's your mum and doesn't want to offend you. So as you're looking at your innovation, as Mark was saying, and town actually, get it out there, show people, don't be afraid of, of people stealing it. We used to have very rarely at Sussex Innovation, people would ask for NDAs, and they were generally the, the ones that never went anywhere because they were so busy protecting it, they didn't give it air, it died. Um, you've just got to put it out there. There will always be competitors. You've just got to back yourself and be robust. And actually competitors are good. If you are the first to market and truly legitimately innovative and nobody else is doing it, you are quite likely to fail. Being first to market is brutal because the consumers don't know that they actually need you. So yeah, don't be afraid to just go out there and show your baby to the world and, and take the feedback. Partnering for me is a real missed opportunity. Um, I think a lot of people think they have to do it themselves or they have to build a team. We talked a little bit around that partnering for support, but I'd also say if you're looking at innovating or you're looking at bringing a new product or service to the market, not only from a revenue perspective, but also from a partnering, uh, sort of a go to market perspective, a partner is an ideal tool to market. Uh, that was how I, I built my award winning Cisco Learning Partner. I was just three of us in a literally a shed in Sunbury, to be fair, it was very glamorous. But I found, running Cisco Training Company, uh, I found two Microsoft houses who couldn't run Cisco Training because of the cost, who needed to work with me to give them a differentiator to their competitors. So if you're looking at an innovation or a new product or service, do look at who that would also be of value to. Um, I was speaking to um, an app developing organization uh, earlier this week who is looking at working with a marketing company because those marketing guys will never develop apps, but they're always talking to people about the branding and the marketing for their app. So collaboratively, they've got a great business perspective going forward. So if you're looking at developing something different, look at who you could work with. You might already have existing partners. You probably have people in your, in your network or in your, um, even in your organization who you might be able to work with to do that. So see partnering as when you're innovating, it's not standalone. And also if you're looking for funding, going together uh, as a consortium is always more powerful. So do think about partnering as you're going forward. Um, back to Curio Magazine, one of my favorite things. And I think I, this is why businesses fail. That's what it's called as a graphic. But I think it also applies as to why innovations fail. Um, and that market need is probably the one that's most important in this conversation is that when you're innovating, you've got to make sure people need it. You've got to go out there. You've got to just be open to hearing that they may not. Um, this graphic is really, really, really handy for me. It's kind of when you're filling in your business model canvas, when you're looking at your innovation and you're looking at your funding and you're pitching for that, that investment, address all of these. You've got to make sure that you've got, you know, you understand your competition, you understand your pricing, you understand your revenue streams. As Mark said, if you're going to get investment, 200,000 pounds, whatever it may be, what that's going on and what that will deliver. But as you know, it, it's, painstaking to see these organizations who who do get good funding and and then just blow it as so they get like punched drunk because they've got a couple hundred thousand there was one i, I knew who hired half a dozen people and three months later had to had to get rid of them and it was horrific to watch and it was the naivety of the founder and then not having someone to um hold him accountable basically um so when you're doing your innovation do keep that one in mind as well um and some of these we've actually talk, talked a little bit about with Tan and, uh, and Mark. And I think it's all really easy to address, but it fails to get funded and it fails to get started without that market perspective and competitive landscape, without the defined market needs, without the defined development costs. Um, another thing we see quite a lot when people come to us on sort of a funding is that everybody could want it. Um, I've got this product that everybody needs. Uh, that doesn't work from a funding perspective it doesn't work from a marketing perspective it doesn't work from any um business generation perspective because you, you need to build that persona remember my little cartoon at the beginning 
you do need to narrow it down into that segment because then it's investable, then it's scalable, then it's tangible, and then it's it, the data becomes relevant as well. Um, we also see a lot of people who, who give lip service to innovation, who see it as a bit of a side hustle and don't give it enough time. You have to find that time as a business owner, which can be quite challenging. Or people like uh, American Express used to have an office in Sussex Innovation Centre to literally take that team out because they knew if they were in the office, they'd be dragged into other conversations. So giving it breathing space, maybe every other Friday um, and going on you know, innovation workouts or, or going to networking or just taking some time out to let it breathe. Uh, a lot of innovation as well fails because people, they, they don't see... I don't see the problem um, that maybe that they're being stubborn or that they, they're creating something that nobody needs. And uh, that comes by, we see build it and they will come a heck of a lot, especially on the tech side. A lot of things don't get to a minimum viable product. They just get thrown out into the world and then uh, slowly um, they get ignored and, and fly, fly away. But yeah, it's kind of seeing this as a side project and seeing it as something you need to own and building its own model canvas, I think it's, it's what makes it really successful. Again, getting all those pieces in as we discussed. Um, but if you start with a why, I'm a big fan of Simon Sinek. So it's quite good to get someone out there and go, I've got this great idea and have somebody go, why, why, why? We do a lot of that when we're reading through the applications um, of just people can't explain their narrative. They don't understand why they're doing it and how they're doing it. They're not getting the data. They're not right, using the right tools to put the pieces together. Um, but it's good to have loads of ideas and then really batten them down into the ones that are going to work and keeping it really lean and keeping it very, keeping curious and keeping learning, because it's also what funders want to see as well, because as we look at the different funding solutions, they want to see that this is an organisation that thinks differently. And you could be looking at existing clients, you could be building um, something from them and that they might be those early adopters, they might get an, a, you know, an a, a deal when they first join you and sign up for your new products or services you might get a minimum viable product that's an mvp again a lot of the reasons why innovation goes wrong is that people build it too far and don't get it out there into test mode you need to get something a bit quick and dirty up there and get it out a good example for me around the mvp is novel versus microsoft uh, you probably heard of microsoft you may not have heard of novel a beautiful fully formed software company that uh, spent too long getting it right and not just getting it out there that got beaten by an organization that has a very different approach to development. I think we put it that way, but you know, we've seen that, you know, we've seen the races, we've seen that sometimes the, the hair does win, unfortunately. But get some beta testing out there, get it bootstrapping. You know, if you can sideline it and have the revenue teams to do it, if you're doing it at that sort of very raw level, how can, how can you get it out there, get that momentum going, get people signing up or, or coming along or whatever the product could be? Um, on the other side, yes, you have venture capitalists, you have the angel investors, the grants and loans. And, and angel investors and venture capitalists aren't all for tech businesses. You have very many different flavors. You have investor networks of people who will happily give five or 10,000 pounds to have a business that they just really believe in and they're not asking for big equity. Um, so it's looking at your investor network. If that's how you see your innovation going forward, tap into your investor network and see what fields they come from. I mean, I've known some who've been at the end of their careers who are quite happy to just put money into a business without wanting a return. So th there are different conversations to be had. There are grants and loans out there as well. Um, I think quite often with grants, you, you need to keep your, your ear out for them. They, they tend to come in flurries. There obviously was quite a few during lockdown. Um, ERDF is, is, is well, the final sort of tranche of that. There's the Community Renewal Fund coming in. You just have to have be signed up to those. You might want to have a separate mailbox for them just to make sure you don't miss out on the ones that come through that you are you are eligible for, but really be quite um, tight on scrutinising the eligibility, which I know sounds silly, but when amount of times people will fill a form in and not realise that it's not correct for their product solution service or even a geographical region. We've had people trying to apply for into a who, who aren't based in region and that just doesn't get through. So be really, do your homework, but do also see filling in an application form as being... Uh, a good test of, of your idea and your innovation. Um, there are also R&D tax credits. Um, I'm not going to sort of go into too much details on those as well, but you, the government website can talk to you about how, how that works and what that's for, getting paid to do your tax credits. But the way this works, I quite like this formula. You've still got to make that investment. 
yes, you can get some money back and you'll use that to reinvest in innovation. So that's a really great tool. And it's worth talking to your accountant about or tapping into the Growth Hub as well to ask for advice as to whether your projects will be eligible and, and how to start. I know many organisations who fill in their own R&D tax credits. I know some who really, really don't want to do that and have outsourced that and have done very well out of it. But it's, it's another process to, to pull into your business. But don't assume that you're not eligible for any of these things just because you maybe think you work in a more traditional business. It's worth investigating it. We are coming to an end. Um, it has been around innovation. The digital tools for innovation, a lot of it for me is really around the data and around business model canvas. There's no digital tool that we can download that will suddenly make you an individual organization, but there are different tools you can bring up into your organization that will help you think more innovatively. A lot of it involves you going out there and actually being curious, to be very honest, but creating that environment to innovate, reaching out to local support resources, using that data. I think that's a really powerful tool. Business model canvas. Um, use your existing contacts and clients and, and partner, get out there and just be a part of a collaboration and a broader story. I think that's that's really key. And if you bring all these pieces in again, you will create something that only has a huge impact on your business, but is also very investable if that's what you're looking to do in terms of earning money. Um, Steph, over to you. Thank you. Um, I mentioned before just around, we've got digital uh, champions supporting us um, and joining the session. So, Lisa, if you'd like to unmute yourself, um, we'd love to hear directly from you just around how um, our SMEs can contact you and how they can get the support. Hi, yeah, that's fine. Sorry, it was taking Thank a minute you. there while you've connected me as a host. It uh, cuts you out and then puts you back in. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, no Apologies. problem. I'm, I'm here now. Thank um, you. Yeah, if, so in terms of the digital champions, um, would you mind going back to the earlier slides just so we can recap on, on who we all are? Oh, they're down here. There you go. Yep, there you go. Yeah, great. So Coast Capital, um, who is a co-supporter of this programme, um, has seven digital champions, and we are here to provide a day of free support for any businesses who have attended one of these webinars. So all of our West Sussex businesses. Um, the day is fully funded by Coast to Capital, so can't stress that enough that it's a day of free support from one of the seven digital champions. Um, you can talk to us about any of these different areas. So you've got Andrew Kerry Bedell, who was on the call earlier, um, who deals with websites and CRMs. I deal with productivity and processes in terms of tech tools. Um, Malcolm Duffett, who has been on some of the earlier sessions, he is an e-commerce expert. Rachel Dines, um, who you may have seen presenting some of the sessions in series two, is SEO expert, marketing. Um, next slide. Thanks, Steph. Well, Rob Lawrence, um, who's also been on lots of these sessions, he deals with the complete digital transformation process. Uh, Rob's actually written a book called Get Fit for Digital, so quite impressed there with his uh, abilities. Roya is digital acceleration and Susan is looking at digital focus on your products and services. And to contact us. Oh, I think that's the one up, isn't it? Yeah. There you go. Thank you. Um, so you'll get this link with the slides after the session. Um, you can click on the contact form. I think I've just seen that pop up that Annie Marie shared that as well. Thank you, Annie Marie. Um, you click on the contact form um, and you just put some basic details in there. Where it says area of expertise required, you don't have to put too much in that box. So if you just need a day of support to help you figure out what on earth you need to do, that is absolutely fine. You can put that in that area. So just say the area of expertise required is a day of digital champion support to help you. Um, then it says growth relationship associate will follow up with you. That will be probably Karen or NASA who are both on this call earlier as well. Um, and they will chat with you. They will point you in the direction of the right digital champion, or you can contact any of the digital champions directly. If we are not the right one to help you, we will let you know that. So we work as a team. We all know what each other can deliver. Um, and we all just want you to get the best value from this support. So reach out to any one of us and we will help you figure out who is going to give you the best value, the best advice in that day. Um, and it says there, undertake a quick digital review. Again, that is nothing scary. It's a 20 question, um, very brief digital questionnaire called DNA6, which just gives you a breakdown of the different areas of digital and you're just able to assess yourself how you're doing in those different areas and that can just help to 
um, lead that conversation. So free support, please take us up on it. We're all here to help you. Thanks, Steph. Thanks, Annie Marie. Definitely. Thank you, Lisa. <clears throat> you, could, you said it much better than I could. And, um, you know, like Lisa said, they're all experts in their different fields. So um, there will be someone that will be able to support what you need from them. So please do um, click on that link that Annie Marie has just shared and add in your details and they'll be in touch with you shortly. So thank you for that, Lisa. Um, they'll all be they'll be joining the, the last two sessions that we're running in series four as well, particularly the Q&A session where NASA is going to be presenting around the support again and answer any questions. So and um, some of the other digital champions will be joining that session. So please do join. So just to give you a bit of an overview, thank you to Lucy for that and to the panelists, Mark and Tan, for um, sharing their thoughts as well. So thank you for that. Um, yeah, Thursday session, a um, bit of a different format, but we're joined by... Um, four different um, businesses um, from West Sussex. So I mentioned Piglet's Pantry, which Lucy also talked about, Sheffield Park, a National Trust venue. Um, who else have we got? We have got a company called Six or Six, um, which look after businesses in um, um, off-premise, so um, bars and pubs. So um, how they navigated all the changes the government made during the pandemic around opening and um, COVID passports, that sort of thing. And then also um, we're joined by um, Jeremy Taylor, who um, looks after um, business support in Gatwick Diamond, saw all those businesses up there in the Gatwick sector. So, um, yeah, and it'll be run by our CEO, Richard Freeman, who's going to be pointing some questions to them around how they navigated and what digital tools they had to take on board um, during the pandemic to support the disruption that um, everything was, <laughs> everyone felt um, around the pandemic. So really get to grips as to what tools and what technology they had to integrate or bring on board um, to help them in their business during that time. So they'll be there to share that. So I do hope you'll join us for that. And again, next Tuesday, the final session in series four, which is around, um, it's more of a, a Q and A, ask the expert kind of panel session where um, you can really get to grips and ask some, some questions that have been on the radar that you've been burning to ask our both our facilitators and our um, digital champions as well. So I hope you can join us for that. We'll include the link there on how to book those sessions, but I hope to see you there. And thank you again to Lucy for joining us. <laughs>